See one online. It's possible. Brought to you by the Service National du Récit de Mendelang. I'm your host, Martin Tremblay, and if you're watching the primary version of this, I will be joined by Nadia Lavando. During this video, we'll show you how to get organized, how to get your students ready to learn online, how to get your students to interact orally in an online ESL class, and finally, we'll give you some more ideas to use technology to support oral interaction. A couple of things you should consider when organizing your online class. First of all, there's the LMS or Learning Management System. So maybe it's already imposed in your school or school board. So maybe you're, you have to work with Google or Microsoft. Uh, if not, maybe you're already working with uh, an LMS and you want to stick with it so that the students don't need to change all of their habits. The other thing you need to consider are the number of groups and students that can influence the way you're going to organize your files, folders, how you're going to communicate with your students. Uh, it's also great to have a, a schedule, a fixed schedule for video conferences so your students don't need to look for you. Uh, if they know that you're there at specific times all the time, then uh, it will be easier for them to remember or to include you in their schedule. Collaboration with other ESL colleagues is essential uh, because you don't want to be alone in, in this. So maybe your colleagues are already using a platform and you want to use the same platform as them. Or maybe you want to share lessons, uh, collaborate when one colleague makes a lesson and you make the other one. Uh, so you can share the load. You should also decide where and how you're going to share the information to both students and parents and probably stick to what you're going to choose as much as possible. So if you're, you decided that you were going to communicate with uh, teachers, uh, with students using email, then uh, you should stick with that. Um, and you should also keep it simple. One tool can do many things. So you have like teachers who are using a certain tool to uh, communicate to their students, but that, that's also how they're going to uh, share the content of their class. And that's also how they're going to get maybe answers uh, from or assignments from their students. And the other thing as well is to uh, listen for feedback and adjust. So uh, it doesn't mean that because you've adopted something that you should stick with it no matter what. If you get feedback from the students or parents that it's not working, feel free to adjust. The other aspect we're going to take a look at is getting the students ready to learn online. So organizing the students can happen before the lesson. You can give access to information about the class, such as your intentions or your instructions or resources before the class so that the students are truly ready to learn or to do the task that you're going to have them do. Don't forget students with difficulties. So you want, might want to differentiate, uh, maybe use proper fonts for students who would have trouble reading, for example. You can ask students to prepare before the class with videos, readings, reflections, or research so that they're better ready to tackle the subject or topic that you're going to be dealing with. What you can do during the lesson is to take time, of course, to explain the organization, what you're going to do, and how you're going to do it. You can practice turning on and off the microphone and camera, but that should be done way early, or this is for especially primary levels. Remind rules and good citizenship uh, during online meetings. This is uh, very important and we have a couple of tools to offer as well for this. Um, you can also use roles which we're going to see in a second. You can have your students practice toggling between two different windows or tabs. This is especially useful if your students need to uh, do something like video conferencing but take a look at some documents at the same time. Then you can use self-evaluation or peer evaluation so that you're not stuck doing all of the evaluation by yourself and it's a great um, practice for your students to develop. What you can do, of course, after the lesson is to follow up with students who had difficulties uh, during your class or those who were absent and take feedback to adjust. 
Now we did say we had some tools. You can uh, find these tools from the Service National du Récit Formation à Distance. Uh, they're the netiquette uh, for the teacher and for the students. So how to be ready to teach and learn online. Uh, so students should not just be made aware of those, but should really understand them. And best practices, of course, for students, so such as setting up their workspace. So it's important that they find a, a quiet space if possible, set themselves some goals, etc. So that too is available for you to download and to share with your students. The other thing that's uh, very important, critical, is plan, plan, and plan it. Okay. Um, so you have a planning tool that you have there, a template. Uh, that you can uh, that you will be able to to download from uh, Julie Stern and the people at ed to save the world dot com. Uh, so this was modified uh, to fit uh, our program here in Quebec. You also have a student version there that you will be able to uh, to access. And don't worry, you don't need to copy everything, well, or rewrite everything. I should say uh, you can just copy paste the information. Basically, what it means is that. Uh, everybody should know where they're going and how they're going to get there. So you should start with a learning intention. Use the tools that you're, you and your students already know, or if not, you will have to take the time to teach how these tools work and maybe even let, uh, well, not even, but you have to let the students uh, play with them. And then uh, plan the organization of small group discussions if you're going to do C1. And maybe think about a plan B if things are not working out the way you thought they were going to. Um, so as I was saying, what's, what the planner is going to help you with is to help you see where you're going. But it's also going to show the students where they're going and how they're going to get there. And this is extremely important, not just in a physical classroom, but even more so in, a, in an online class. All right. So best practices to be organized is to develop routines. So if your students come in your class and they know how uh, the English class is going to unfold, uh, that helps. It lowers anxiety both for them and for yourself. Um, you should make sure expectations are clear to students and that they are visible. So using that planner there is important. Uh, plan short and focused lessons. So you cannot be speaking for 75 minutes. That's not going to happen. All right. So make sure that you plan for short lessons. Maybe you, you will have some clips there that you could play and then you tell them what to do with it and so on. Make sure that there is a sequence and that the sequence is clear. Don't be afraid to use numbers like this is step one, step two, step three, because it's very easy to get lost using different tools or uh, trying to follow part of an online class in an asynchronous way so that means that the student is on his own so where where is he and uh, where where is he supposed to go next so if you have this numbered out then it makes it easier for the students to follow where they were and where they have to go next and you can assign some roles to the students speaking of these roles here they are you'll recognize these roles from the uh, from cooperative uh, learning and so on, uh, but they are a little bit uh, modified for online learning. So you you can have a leader, and if you have oral interactions, the leader is going to start the meetings. That would be his job. Uh, shares the screen when needed, because sometimes you will have to watch uh, a video before talking or answering questions, so that would be the leader's job to do that. Uh, the leader is going to keep the team on task. That would also be the leader's job. The reminder, you're going to recognize the timekeeper. So keeps the team aware of time, but also reminds the team of where to go when the team is done and reminds team of success criteria. The note taker, as the name suggests, is going to take uh, notes, summarizing team discussions and decisions within the group and keep uh, all necessary notes. The seeker is going to seek answers to uh, the to questions that the group might have. So just like in a physical uh, environment, you wouldn't have you wouldn't want to have all of your students uh, 
standing up and coming to see you or all of them raising their hands at once. So that would be the seeker's job. So to represent the team when they're asking questions to the teacher and then to report findings to the team. The seeker uh, in high school levels could be a student who would have two devices, maybe check some information on a cell phone while uh, doing a video conference with uh, the team um, on another device like a laptop or a tablet. Okay, so just how can students interact orally in an online ESL class? Remember that before the oral interaction, it's essential to present the intention of the task, the instructions, success criteria, maybe a model of what success looks like and sounds like, that's if they are available, if you don't have any of them right now this year, it would be a good time maybe to ask some of the students if you could keep their recording and there are uh, vid video editing tools out there uh, like clips where you could uh, pretty much make sure that the students cannot be identified but you could actually have your other students in future years see and hear uh, what success sounds like without being able to identify the students within the video. You should go over the functional language, or better yet, maybe brainstorm the functional language with your students, or have them brainstorm it. Uh, you should go over communicative strategies with your students that would be uh, helpful uh, within a C1, and go over the rules which we have talked about before. So now we're going to go and see it up close, what it looks like using Microsoft Teams and using Google Meet. So here we are in my Teams environment where I would like to have my students join and uh, have a C1 together. So what I do is I work with Teams as my uh, main ecosystem to deliver information and content to my students. So what I did is I just I created a pretend group of secondary five. So I would have all of my secondary five students uh, within that channel, the general channel. This is where I would uh, post the information, the content to my class. So what I do is that I make sure that the students cannot uh, add anything here. So by uh, removing, by managing the channel here, and then only owners can post messages. And therefore I know that the students uh, won't be able to post anything. All right, so if I come back to what I had planned for my students, my students would come on this page and they would know, okay, we're at class three because last time was class two and I have step one, I have step two and so on. Three steps for today's class, okay? So they know that this is where the, where the work is. So they, they could already check it out when they come into class. They don't even need me. They could start right away. I used another... Um, program from Microsoft called Sway to communicate the content of the class with them so they could just follow that link and instead of me uh, speaking to the whole class then they could uh, enter that presentation just like they would have a, um, a manual in class and then they could just follow with their their book for example except now it's online so it I talk about what we did last class. So last class, we learned more about visual clues that help us make predictions and inferences in texts. Today, we're looking at emotional clues. Then I state my intentions for the class. Of course, I could do this with the students, just like I am doing, I'm using a, a video right now where I could have, uh, I could use my voice to help the students navigate that. That would be especially useful at the beginning when they're not used to working online. Uh, and if you want to do it in a synchronous way, that's one way you could do it. So your whole class is there. If somebody comes in late or miss the class, they can always have access to the content of your class. But you could also do it in an asynchronous way where students would look at this maybe even before class and then they would know what they would have to do when they come in and see you. So you see you have all of the intentions for today. And what I did, of course, is after stating my intentions, I still use, uh, I still prepare my students for learning. So I go over 
prior knowledge or teach them what they need to know. In this case here, I want to make sure that they know the definition of empathy. And instead of uh, saying, okay, please uh, go and read uh, the definition, what I did is I, I fetched three different types of definitions. Actually, this one is a quote. And then I prepared a form using Microsoft Form. And then I could ask the students if they already know certain expressions, what they understand from these, uh, uh, these definitions, which ones are more helpful to them and which ones have the most uh, helpful uh, images, for example. So instead of saying, okay, please read the definition, they actually read the definition three times by the end of this. Now, of course, students being students, they could just click on anything and uh, get on with it. So that's why I also created a little video using uh, Adobe Spark and putting it in Edpuzzle to insert questions and then I could check for their understanding right there so this is a little video it lasts 38 seconds it took me maybe two three minutes to, to create using Adobe Spark and then I put it into Edpuzzle and I added some questions to make sure that uh, I would be able to check if they understood uh, the definitions of empathy I gave them all right so once they would be done with that, theoretically, they could start uh, thinking about doing the oral interaction. So discover how empathy can help us predict and infer. So they could take the necessary notes that they would need for their oral interaction. So I have my success criteria here. And for the for functional language, as I had mentioned before, a great trick would be to have them brainstorm the functional language they think they would need in order here to cooperate with others to share ideas and opinions support their viewpoints and so on if you don't have a link uh, maybe you want to try one example with your students to model what you expect from uh, this task and then um, and then that's it once they would be done they could go back to the general channel for step two So they would come back here to the general channel. So in case you're wondering how can your students get in touch with you if uh, they cannot write on your general channel, the idea is that if they start chatting on the general channel, then all of your content uh, will go up and up and up and up and you don't want that. So I created a channel especially for uh, questions and, and chat. So this is where they would write to the teacher. And of course, it would just be for constructive comments or asking questions, because if they all start writing hi, then you will get like dozens, if not hundreds of hi and emojis and so on. And you don't want that. So it's really important to tell your students that they're using this space just for questioning. So let's get back to our uh, step two for that class. So as you can see, we've already lived this class, so that's why I had to scroll up. So step two, oral interaction instructions. So as you can see, my instructions are clearly stated here. So we'll watch a video together. Try to put yourself in the shoes of the two main characters after the video in your teams. So not my screen, of course. You will go in your channel for your group discussion. And here are the discussion groups. So then I would have the discussion groups uh, stated there as well. Okay, so, uh, so as you can see, it's clearly identified what they need to do first, second, and third. Of course, I would have my discussion groups and the names of who's going to go in which group. So let's take a look at these discussion groups. So what I did beforehand is that since this has all of my secondary five students all together, I created eight different groups uh, for discussion. Now, the idea here is that if you're going to have one channel per group, let's say, and you have eight groups or six groups, you're going to end up creating 48 to 64 of these different groups. So if you just have like one gigantic group like this for your all of your secondary five students you could just create eight groups so this today let's say i'm meeting with 502 at two o'clock well then it's fine all of my 502 students will come in at this time and they will see that they have these 
a discussion group. So they're actually just channels that I created beforehand so that the students could go in there and chat. They're also called breakout rooms. If you don't know how to create them, there are great tutorials that we're going to leave the links to how to create these breakout rooms. But basically, this is where the students are going to go and discuss. Now, before you go and try to head with 32 students in eight different discussion groups, uh, we strongly recommend that you try it out with maybe four students divided in two groups or eight students divided in two group and you keep growing 16 students 24 students and then 32 students so eventually so just that you see how it works the students understand what they need to do where they need to go and how it works to create the meetings and so on so i hope i'm not going too fast but basically what would happen in this case here my students would watch a, a video with me in class, so on the online class, and then I would ask the students to go into their groups and discuss. So let's go into one of the groups, all right? So let's go up, as you can see, the, this group uh, had chatted a lot. So, again, in the discussion groups, you have the different uh, instructions then you would have their roles so if ever they need something they, they 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 can have it it's accessible the questions that they need to answer for the oral interaction are there and also the success criteria so everything is there okay so what they would need is to actually watch the video i would give them and then um, they would go and discuss now how would they start the discussion well, there are different ways to start the discussion. You can have the leader of the team start a discussion. That means that this leader has a computer or a laptop uh, because tablets don't have this little button here. Now this button, the camera, is there to start meetings. So if they're using a tablet, they don't have this button. So the leader is someone who has a laptop or computer. Or better yet, for all of these groups, you could, within your Outlook, create a meeting, a Teams meeting, for each and every one of the eight groups. It would give you eight different hyperlinks that you would just copy-paste in each and every one of these uh, channels. So that way, even if the students have tablets or if they don't know who the leader is or how to start the meeting, they would just click on the hyperlink and access the meeting just like that. OK, so there I am. OK. <laughs> so you see, as the, the meeting would be here, it would also be possible. There you go. So it would be possible for me to just go back to whatever the questions would be. So just by clicking here. So if I'm a, a student, I could be right here. So you'll see my outside office, AKA car. And uh, I would just be able to go into Teams right here and have access to the questions again. All right. So all of the questions and then I can access these questions and I could continue my meeting right here. So. I could have all of my information and still do my oral interaction. All right, so basically that's how a group would have their uh, C1. And when they would be finished, so let's say you give them a certain amount of time, then they would go back to the general channel for to, to, to maybe wait for further instructions. Or in this case, I even added like a step three so they could just move on and do step three, which would be the reflection for their class. And that would be it for that class. Uh, and as for the teacher, you the teacher, what you want to do is once you're done with that uh, general meeting and you say to your groups, OK, you're going to go and discuss into your uh, your meetings. Your students will just leave and go to these other groups. You, on the other hand, you're able to go and visit each of these different groups and access their meeting just by joining the meeting that is unfolding. 
So let me repeat that. You would ask all of your students to leave the general channel and to go to their corresponding groups. And once they're there and they have started, you could go and visit each of the groups just like you would in a physical classroom and visit like their tables or their desks. And then you could go and join their meetings and simply uh, pick up the phone if you want and hang up. Pick up the phone and hang up. So join the meeting and then hang up. Pick and join the meeting and hang up like once you're, you're done uh, hearing what you want to hear. So like I said, once everything is finished, they go back to the general uh, meeting and they can just head to the next step. So all of this uh, information, all of this material is also available uh, within uh, certain links that we will be providing on uh, Service National du Récit de Mandelang's website. Okay, let's take a look at some ideas to use technology to support oral interaction. These ideas can be done in a physical environment using technology or they can also be done uh, online. We're going to take a look at how to use surveys for oral interaction, how to use interactive quizzes for oral interaction, and how we can use video conferencing to interact with the rest of the world or to have authentic uh, oral interaction with other speakers around the world. So let's get started. So using surveys for C1 or oral interaction. So some ideas to use surveys for oral interaction can include discussing the results of class surveys to prompt C1. So for example, you come into your class or your online class and you quickly use a survey tool like a Google Form or a Microsoft Form or a Mentimeter to survey your class. And then you can ask them a question. And then, for example, here, uh, let's, let, let's see uh, what the students would have answered. So 70% of the class just said they would like to have their driver's license before their Sec 5 diploma. So should the government ask students to have their diploma before they can have their license to decrease dropout rates? And then you would just send your students into their discussion groups or their meet. And then they would uh, discuss uh, possible answers. So that's just a very, very, very quick way to maybe get a conversation going among students. Could be done uh, to bring up, uh, to just to warm them up at the beginning of a class. Or it could be done in the middle of a class to prompt uh, oral interaction given that there's a context before that, of course. Um, the other ideas to use surveys, we're going to have students design surveys or polls collaboratively for real audiences. So you could have your students design uh, certain surveys or polls so they, they can do those on paper to start with. So the idea would be to have the students uh, interact orally, be it in a physical classroom or online, and then they would design their questions. So that would be a great way, you know, to um, to study biases and so on. And how can biases infiltrate uh, surveys, for example. And then they would interact orally uh, to create those surveys and, of course, carry them out for real audiences. The last idea would be to use survey tools to gather data after consensus from a team. Let's have a look. So I would have first created some breakout rooms and I would have assigned them to my students. I would ask the students to join their room and then the leader of the team would share his or her screen to maybe show a tool like Mentimeter or a Google Form or a Microsoft Form because what we want is for the students to discuss the question, the question, and after coming to a consensus, then they would write one answer for the whole team. After seeing the results from the first survey, then I can add a twist. I can have students individually read different information-based texts that will validate, invalidate, or add nuance to their original answers. After debating, the team would answer the question again using the same tool, so Menti or uh, the Google Forms. So what would it look like? So here's an example. 
Let's pretend that we have been learning about how informative texts and surveys can help shape our opinions in the broad area of learning of environmental awareness. We've already been exposed to vocabulary about resource consumption, proximity, comparatives, superlatives, understanding graphics, etc. So now my students come into class and I could ask them, hey, which bever beverage do you think is better for the environment? And right on the top of their head, or maybe like uh, what, what they think is the, the best, or maybe they're informed, they're going to answer and give their opinion right there. So here you have uh, the example. So these students, as you can see, here it says six. It's not because there were only six students. There were actually 18 students because there were groups of three, and I had six groups of, of three. So three of the groups said it was almond milk, and two of the groups said it was soy milk, and uh, one group said it was cow's milk. Then what I did is I would give different uh, texts to each student. So you have student one, student two, student three, you know how it goes. And then you had the graphic that, it, that they could read and understand, but they also had some information about uh, a type of milk. And within that text, not everything was black or white. Okay, so there were some nuances and that they would need to take into consideration when discussing. So, for example, uh, soy milk uh, requires, for example, uh, deforestation. Oops, so that's not so eco-friendly after all. Cow's milk, if it comes from Quebec, uh, doesn't use as much uh, water uh, because that we use a lot of rainwater, for example. So there are some nuances like that that the students could have added. Then, after reading the texts, they would have to discuss, but this time, I'm telling you, it would take a lot more time because that, then they would have information to support and justify their opinions. So, as you can see, also, the answers have changed. So after coming to a consensus, still, the students decided, uh, five groups decided that soy milk was the one that was better for the environment. So that's just a quick example, but students really uh, were able to talk during that time. So that's a great way in class or online to have your students talking. Using interactive quizzes for C1. So ideas to use quizzes for, for oral interaction can include collectively create quizzes for other students. So older students or even uh, like in second one and two, I think it's feasible to have students create some cahoots. So again, using the idea of having a leader for the team uh, using his or her screen, then the students would have to get together and create the questions uh, after consensus of course so it looks a little bit like creating the survey but this time it's creating quizzes so it can be about a, a text that they've read um, so or the characters of a story things like that they can discuss possible answers to questions and collectively agree on answers to questions we're going to take a look at these last two so discussing possible answers to questions and collectively agreeing on answers to questions so using some videos and ed puzzle it is really uh, nice and feasible so using it puzzle what you could do is use a video that you uh, would have found uh, from the author on YouTube and then uh, one very easy way to do this is, for example, watching a video and then cutting it halfway and then asking, uh, for example, if you're going to be studying uh, predictions and inferences, how do they think it's going to end? Okay, so you have an example right there that we're going to include that you can find for inferences and predictions where you could do just that. So they would watch the, the, the beginning of the video stop it halfway and then they would have to discuss how they think it's going to end based on certain clues then of course you could make it even more complicated all right so as you can see here i only had one question is and it was how do you think it's going to end so let's see so put yourself in their shoes what is she probably thinking and try predicting what's going to happen this time in this one i created with the same video, I created 
a lot more questions. So you can see them there. So I have a lot more questions. So the way this would work is again, you would have your students go into their discussion groups or into their meeting or in a physical environment. They would be at their table using one device and then they would take a look at the video. But this time, every time there's a question, the video is going to stop. Let's have a look. So Edpuzzle uh, allows me to integrate my questions right away in the video. So nobody has to like stop the video and they can all be at different places. And then uh, the students would interact to answer the question. They don't even need to write the answer. Okay, So that's why you can just put it as notes instead of open-ended questions. And then they would discuss the different answers. So that's one great way that you can use Edpuzzle uh, to have um, discussions. So using interactive quizzes for C1. And finally, using video conferencing to interact with the rest of the world. So that's a great idea. It might be uh, might seem far fetched for for some at the moment, but with some time or even in a physical environment, this is feasible. So using video conferencing in ESL, I'm sure that uh, because of the current situation, a lot of people will become uh, pros at using video conferencing. So interact with other students from around the world interact and question experts in a certain field, reach a certain audience for a given project, or work collaboratively with people who are outside your own school. So just imagine, take the time to think about it. You could have like two, uh, two classes, your class and a colleague's class in another school, and you could have your students uh, talk together. It's like get to know each other and things like that. Or maybe do the same activity we just saw with the videos. If you don't have enough participants in your class, maybe you can combine them with a colleague's class in, from another school or even a school board or even a country. So you could reach a certain audience for a given project. Uh, we're going to take a look at this in a second. And that, that's it. Let's take a look. So one of the tools that you could use is Skype. We often think about Skype as a, a way to... Uh, get in touch with our relatives uh, from around the world but uh, you can also use something that's called Skype in the classroom it's actually um, incorporated in the uh, the ecosystem from uh, Microsoft okay so your students could use the same credentials that they use to get into their Microsoft environment if you wanted to use it individually but you don't even need to do it individually but you, you could do it like that. So Skype in the Classroom is a free community that offers live transformative educational experiences for students, including virtual field trips. So imagine you could have your students go on a virtual field trip and ask questions to experts or talk uh, with guest speakers. So there are tons of different invitations and so on, or people who offer their services could be uh, a ranger in a national park talking about his or her national park and your students get to ask questions and so on and they can prepare in advance so and all of this is sort of organized and you just need to to join or set uh, a time with that uh, with that guest and like i said before you could have classroom to classroom connections and live collaboration projects so if you are interested in our presentation you will see it in action so skype in the classroom and you'll see a project for the primary but that can that could easily be seen in a secondary class and everything to get started so we thank you very much for having joined us. Uh, this was a lot of information, but we suggest that you try things uh, one step at a time. Maybe come back to this video as often as you need and maybe watch it in parts. As always, you can find us at uh, domainedeslangues.qc.ca. So that's for um, our uh, our website. We also have Réseau Pédago Numérique. This is a great place to see some uh, teachers in action, seeing how they prepared their class or carried out some tasks or how they integrated, uh, uh, had the, their students integrate uh, their teaching. 
There are some uh, workshops and uh, trainings offered on Campus Ricci. We invite you to take to check them out. Um, and of course, you can follow us. Uh, we have our email addresses and our Twitter uh, account so that you can follow us. All right. We hope that this is going to be helpful and uh, we're there for you. Enjoy.